Before I get into the actual mission that I flew in the fixed-wing gunship, I want to talk a little bit about the aircraft itself. Uh, it was designated as a AC-119G uh, attack gunship. And the aircraft that I flew was outfitted with four 7.62 millimeter uh, rotating barrel Gatling guns. Uh, those guns were mounted on the left side of the aircraft and the pilot actually pulled the trigger to shoot the guns. The crew consisted of uh, a, a lot of different people and, and doing a lot of different functions, but there was a pilot and there was a co-pilot and then there was a flight engineer. The flight engineer sat right directly behind the console in the center behind the pilot and the co-pilot. Behind him on the right side behind the co-pilot sat one of the two navigators. This navigator was our call. We called him the table navigator. And he's the guy that, that got us to the general area we wanted to, to be in. He had maps of every area that we had. Of course, the maps were all 30 years old. And so they weren't totally accurate and up to date, but they were close enough that we could use them. But this navigator directed us to the target areas or wherever we needed to go. Uh, the second navigator was down in the cargo compartment, and he was the night observation device operator. And what that item was was a, a telescope-looking instrument that hung out one of the doors they had removed, and it was on the left side of the aircraft. And wherever this uh, device was pointed, it showed up on the crosshairs of my pilot screen, and if I pointed the aircraft at the same place where he was pointing this device, then that's where the bullets would go. And we maintained about a 25 degree bank and about 140 miles an hour in this circular pattern. And we could put bullets down. Uh, we were authorized to put them down as close as 100 yards from friendly troops, which we were the only fixed wing aircraft that could shoot that close to friendlies. And a few times, unfortunately, we did. But anyway, back to the aircraft, uh, it, it was powered by two 3,350 radial compound uh, piston-driven engines. And uh, these engines had many, many thousands and thousands of hours on them and had been rebuilt more times than you can imagine. And so their performance wasn't up to the specifications of the original uh, design. But uh, so, in fact, we could get maybe three to 400 hours per engine before they would uh, either quit running or run poorly or, uh, or just not run, you know, good enough to keep the aircraft in the air. Uh, so they had to be removed and, and, a, and a new rebuilt engine put back on it. Uh, same with the four bladed uh, propellers. Uh, they had a lot, a lot of years on them. And sometimes they would function properly, and sometimes they wouldn't. And that, that was almost, to lose one of those was almost worse than losing an engine because you didn't have any control over where the power was going and whether it was helping you or pushing you or dragging you. Uh, the the uh, Further back from the guns, there was a uh, illumination device. It looked like one of these lights you see at a car dealership. And this light put out a million and a half candle power of, of light. And it had either a white version, which just light up the ground just like it was daytime, or it had an infrared uh, version, which put out kind of a blue light that, was, that, that the night observation device then, his device would amplify that light, and we could see like daytime through his, through his uh, device. Uh, across the back of the plane, on the opposite side, was a flare launcher. It would, uh, it would launch 24 flares, uh, you could normally you'd launch them one at a time and each flare had a parachute on it and you would drop it upwind from your target area and it would float down on this parachute and float across the target so it would illuminate the ground where we could see just like like daytime uh, and that was better to use that than it was the light because uh, the light also made us shine up in the dark where the flare uh, illuminated mainly down and, and didn't leave a, a much of a, of a chance for them to see us up higher. Uh, but we would launch those flares, uh, you know, sometimes 6 and 8, 10, 12, rarely ever that many because we didn't stay on a target that long. But uh, we could, and those guns, the guns were, like I say, 7.62 millimeter, 
and we could shoot up to 6,000 rounds per minute per gun. Uh, that means all four guns at high rate could shoot 24,000 rounds a minute. That's a lot of bullets. Now, we normally would not use the four guns at high rate uh, very often because we would run out of bullets too quick. It was, uh, most missions we would carry approximately 40,000 rounds and we hated to bring any rounds back and so we looked for targets that we could expend and help our, our our ground people the Cambodian nationals and the Cambodian army we would help them suppress the attacks that they were being uh, hit with uh, there was a few occasions where we did shoot uh, the high rate and and uh, it was very effective when we when we did but normally we would use short bursts and we would uh, pinpoint, pinpoint the target and ask the ground commander, you know, to let us know how our shooting is. And he would call back and say it's good or move it 100 yards north or south or east or west, whichever. But uh, a very good weapon system. And like I say, we used it uh, uh, very effectively ourselves. To finish out the explanation of all the equipment and personnel on the gunship, in the back of the aircraft, there was uh, two gunners, and one gunner uh, in particular was a, a personal friend and, and a good guy. That was uh, Chris Chrisman, and uh, Chris became my gunner when I first got my first crew, and he stayed with me all the way till I left, and he was really a good kid, a nice guy, and uh, he, in fact, after he got back from from Vietnam, uh, he was able to get uh, approved to go to Air Force pilot training. And last I heard from him, he was at uh, Reese Air Force Base uh, going through pilot training. A really, really nice guy. I wish I could get in touch with him again someday if I could just uh, get some help finding him. Uh, but the two gunners, they, they kept the guns loaded and, and made sure the ammunition was ready. And then the, the other crew member was an illuminator operator. And his job was to keep the generator running to make sure that we had enough electrical power to run the guns and run the light and run the flare launchers and all the other equipment that was on the aircraft. When we were in the firing circle, his job was kind of twofold because he was the observer to help make to, to identify any ground fire that was coming up so he could tell us where it was and which way to dodge or which way to shoot. Uh, but in his spare time, when he wasn't doing that, uh, he would help the gunners make sure that the bullets were available and everything on the plane was ready to, to shoot. Uh, one last, and we'd call him a part-time crew member, was we had a French interpreter that would fly with us on some of the night missions. Uh, the Cambodian ground people, the radio operators especially, uh, they didn't have enough of them, and, and most of them could all speak English, but they would get some hours off in the middle of the night so they could get some sleep. So they would substitute a Cambodian uh, radio operator, and uh, he could speak Cambodian and he could speak French. So we would need to bring a French interpreter on the plane with us so that when I was communicating with the ground commander, I would tell the interpreter, and he would translate it into French to the ground radio operator who took the French that he received and communicated it in Cambodian to the ground commander. And so it's a rather cumbersome way to communicate, and it did slow things down. But when you don't have anybody on the ground that's speaking English, uh, it made it uh, difficult and dangerous not to have somebody that could interpret and tell us exactly what was going on. But... Uh, Many times we found the uh, the interpreter a dispensable crew member because if we couldn't carry thirty to forty thousand rounds of ammunition, then it didn't hardly pay for us to go out and and do our job. So if if uh, we couldn't carry enough bullets, we'd kick the interpreter off and and we'd add two hundred pounds more of bullets, which uh, gave us more to shoot with. <laughs>